have my bag here. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Horner. I'm the head of the education department here at the Michael C. Carlos Museum. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you on this beautiful afternoon um, to this conservation conversation. These are always some of our most popular programs as people love to see behind the scenes and learn at the great work of Renee Stein and her colleagues in our conservation lab. Um, I would like to just announce one other upcoming program. As a university museum, we don't often do that much programming in the summer, but we have two very special events um, this week. This Friday, the 18th at noon, our curator of ancient Egyptian, Nubian, and Near Eastern art, Dr. Melinda Hartwick, who is also Professor Emerita at Georgia State University, will premiere the first lecture in her new series with uh, the Great Courses Plus, which is called A Guided Tour Through Ancient Egypt. And so she will introduce that lecture. Uh, we will send you a link to screen that lecture and then she'll do a Q&A. So you can register for that online at carlos.emory.edu um, and join us for that event. Today, we are so thrilled to um, welcome Renee Stein, who is our chief conservator here at the Carlos Museum, and her colleague, Mimi Levesque, who has joined us once again from Boston. Well, I mean, she has come from Boston to the Carlos and is here with us, and they have been working all week and will continue to work next week on these two mummies that have recently come into the Carlos Museum. And you'll see uh, Renee is in the galleries right now and Mimi is upstairs in Ackerman Hall where they've been working in this pop-up lab. And today they're going to fill you in about the work that they've been doing. So I'm going to turn off my camera and let them talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. We're delighted to be with everyone this afternoon. Um, as those who are frequent visitors to the museum know, we have just deinstalled an exhibition from our third floor temporary galleries. So they're a little hollow sounding. I am right across uh, the hall from Mimi right now so that we can come to you without masks to, for the beginning of our presentation this afternoon. So I'm sitting in these um, empty galleries awaiting our next exhibition. And we're using this summer uh, as an opportunity to get some work done in anticipation of the exhibition for 2023 of the Sinusric collection, which came to the Carlos Museum in 2018 as the gift of the Georges Ricard Foundation and the Ricard family. And we are delighted to welcome this uh, diverse and wonderful ex uh, collection into our museum. And about half of the collection is Egyptian art. And our curator, Dr. Melinda Hartwig, is organizing selections from the collection into an exhibition. The collection includes two mummies. So uh, we're excited to have Mimi with us again to get these mummies ready for the exhibition. And we had planned this work uh, for last summer, but like everything else, it was postponed due to COVID. So we're delighted and grateful that we've arrived at a moment when she can travel here from Boston and be with us to work for these two weeks. We have taken over the Ackerman Hall, where frequently we lecture or have events here at the Carlos Museum. And we have set it up as a, as Elizabeth said, pop-up conservation lab. And uh, we're also using this opportunity to make some updates to our lab in the basement. So um, this is quite a busy time for us, even though campus is quiet for the summer, we're quite busy here at the museum. Mimi has come with us uh, several times. In fact, when I first joined the Carlos over 20 years ago, Mimi was working on the Niagara Collection Mummies, which came to the museum in 1999. And she was among the first uh, conservation consultants that I met who were working here at the museum. And we have remained uh, co colleagues and collaborators ever since. Most recently, uh, a number of years ago now, we worked on the Old Kingdom Mummy, which is still on display in the Carlos Museum's permanent galleries. And um, since then, continuing some work on 
shirt fragments that were found on that mummy. So I'm delighted to have this opportunity to look at another set of mummies with Mimi, and this time also with um, some wonderful cartonage that she's treating with us. So uh, with that little bit of introduction to our project, let me take you into Mimi and the, the Ackerman Hall so she can tell us a little bit about these mummies. Um, as I said, they came to us in 2018 as part of a collection and they have been quietly waiting for us to begin this treatment. So Mimi, let me turn it to you um, to introduce us to our subjects for these two weeks. All right. Um, we would like to obviously introduce you to the mummies. Both were from the site of Achmed in Egypt, and they date from the Ptolemaic period, which is 332 to 30 BCE. Cyrus is the one that you see on, uh, on the screen now. It's the uh, uh, PowerPoint going? Renee? Right now, you, we have the view of you, um, and you can just introduce this to the two mummies, and then I'll bring it Oh, it's right here. Fine. I wasn't sure whether you were seeing the PowerPoint first. All right, this is Tal Osiris. Um, she, her name means the one of Osiris, and the inscription on her coffin, which we don't have in here, states that she was the wild princess of Osiris, daughter of Nesmin and Ta'amun, and her horizontally wrapped outer linen bandages were coated on the upper side of the black resin, which you really can't see very clearly at the moment, but it shows a little bit of the sides. Mimi, I'm gonna interrupt you just for a moment. We've heard through the chat that the sound isn't clear. If you could um, rearrange your mic and speak up just a bit, we'll see if that helps. We'll give that a try. How's Thank this? Thank you. Um, is that any better? I hope. <laughs> I hope we get some feedback. Uh, a fine linen shroud that covers the outer wrappings. It was once dyed a pink or a pale red, but it's now faded to beige, except for the cartonage panels cover the shroud. Her CT scans revealed that she was over 30 when she died. I can hear that this is coming in and out, so I hope it works. Um, and we want to acknowledge the excellent report by Jonathan Elias on the results of the x-rays and CT scans done at Emory Hospital, and thanks to everyone involved with that project. Some of you may have seen his terrific Carlos Museum Zoom web Zoom presentation a couple months ago, um, and you can still watch that on the museum's website. Um, a new group of decorative trappings were secured to the mummy, and we're now putting them back on, so you can see part of them there. Um, they have been removed and stored separately. They're made of a material called cartonnage, which is a composite material used by the ancient Egyptians to create a lightweight, smooth, hard surface to support paintings made from layered strips of linen and then saturated with animal glue and shaped. I'm not moving around because I'm hoping the, micro the microphone won't joggle too much. Um, the linen surface is covered with a material like gesso, either calcium carbonate or calcium sulfate based on one or both sides and then painted. Tanosiris's trappings are a painted and gilded cartonage mask, which you will see soon. Um, a pectoral panel with a broad collar and an image of the goddess Nut with outstretched wings, an abdominal cover mummy on a beer, worn by Isis and Nephthys, and it's very interesting. We can't really show you because it's so tiny, but the artist actually made a mistake and made two goddess Nephthyses instead of an Isis and a Nephthys. So I, and since her name is Tom Osiris, I just wonder how that was when <laughs> I went down with the family. Um, and then she has a very badly damaged foot covering that we'll talk more about later, but it shows the remains of sandal feet. The second mummy here is called, has been called Padivasta, but that was due to a mistaken translation of the hieroglyphic text block on the coffin by the previous owners. Unfortunately, the actual Egyptian name of that individual is not known. So, um, part because the coffin was severely overcleaned in the past, and that erased 
the actual name of the mummy. This mummy originally had a foreign shroud, tiny traces still remain. And he probably also had Kurtnoff's trappings, but like, like those of Tom Cyrus, but they were lost. And um, we have no idea where they ended up. The body was wrapped in many layers of linen, far more than um, you would normally see in mummies of this period. Um, and then the outermost layer was covered with black resinous material that you can see there. Um, his CT scans revealed him to have been in his 60s when he died. So that's our two mummies. Terrific. So we are still getting a bit of um, comment that it's difficult to hear. And I know that Elizabeth is working on the sound. I will be joining Mimi momentarily uh, and we'll be masked at that point. So we're working on getting the sound to be more audible. We each have a lavalier mic. So you might also double check that your devices are turned up at home. Um, I actually hear Mimi quite well separately uh, in this room, but I agree it is a bit echoey. So just to let folks know at home that we are working to clarify the sound. Um, and in the meantime, what I'd like to do is bring up um, a few slides to share with you all so that you can see the condition of these mummies when Mimi arrived at the beginning of last week. Um, as I mentioned, we had um, Mimi come in advance to look at the mummies, and so she had seen their condition and we had planned this treatment, knew about how much time we would need, uh, especially since we'd worked together and Mimi has so much experience with mummies, she uh, was able to anticipate the flow of the project. So beginning um, from the PowerPoint, let me share the screen. Mm -hmm. All right, and to start from the first slide, if it will let me. Great. So this is um, Tao Cyrus, the mummy that you've just met in the front of the view of Ackerman Hall. And this is a photograph taken to document her condition before Mimi began the treatment, which started last uh, Tuesday, actually. So um, Mimi, are there things that you would like to highlight about the condition of Tao Cyrus as can be seen by our audience in this image? Yes, there, she's actually, her mummy is actually in pretty good condition. Um, you can see the linens are loose. The wrapping, the outer level of wrapping is loose at the bottom on your left. And um, that we're beginning to straighten. There was also damage at the foot, but interestingly, her, these linens are very soft still and very flexible and are in really pretty good condition. So her body is very, stable and sound. One of the wonderful things about having the x-rays and CT scans done ahead of time was so that we were able to understand exactly what the condition of the body was. This is something I find incredibly useful while I'm working on mummies because I can, I can see by the x-rays and CT scans that there wasn't a lot of damage internally that were, was invisible or underneath her so that we didn't have to really worry about those things. Um, and the only problem was, is that she, like all the material was very dusty. And so we, we knew we were going to have to do an awful lot of cleaning when we first started. So how about the next slide? Terrific. I'm also paying an eye to the chat and see that several folks have said, now that you have your mask on, uh, it's actually much better. So that both oh, of But I think it's thanks to Elizabeth who's fixing the sound. Excellent, just wanted you to know uh, as we continue. All right, so I'm gonna go to the next slide, which is actually an image of Tao Cyrus's trappings, which you mentioned before as they're visible in this uh, view of the room, but now you have um, them up on the screen so folks can see as they were separate from the mummy, the mask and the re rest of the cartonnage pieces. So if you have want anything to say about those as well, Absolutely. The mask is on the upper left and it had been stored separately at some point. And as a result, I think just laid flat um, and it's distorted now. So the mask is very warped. There are areas along the edges that you can't really see in this image very clearly, but there's um, a, a tear on the, what would be the proper right side of the wig lappet. 
And then there are separations that are going all around the side of the cartonnage mask. But otherwise, that mask is pretty solid. It's made from a number of layers of uh, linen. And so it's actually a much easier piece to work on in terms of its solidity than any of the others. Um, the second one in, in the middle at, on the top is a pectoral panel. It depicts a broad collar, um, and then it has the winged goddess Nut below. This is very thin. And in fact, um, the backside of it was repaired in antiquity. So they obviously felt like they'd made it too, too thin to begin with. And there's an extra sort of cobbled together piece of linen on the, on the back. Um, her wings were broken in several places. The panel that, um, that Nut is kneeling over also was missing both bottom corners. Um, and then there was damage to the upper uh, corners of the broad collar as well. Next to that is an abdominal panel that would have gone over the sort of legs, the upper part of the thighs, from the sort of the stomach down to the thighs. And that tab you can see at the bottom is broken off. Um, mostly in, the sides have a few small splits, but although this is very thin, it doesn't have quite as much other damage, areas of damage as one might have feared. Down below that is what's left of the foot covering or boot that would have gone over the feet of the mummy. At this point, it's completely unclear whether um, the, there was a back to it. Um, some of these are only front sides. Some of them go all the way over the top of the feet and have the bottoms of the sandals depicted uh, on the other side. We can't tell because this is all that is left to us, but it's been crushed and the inside linen layers are broken. Um, probably, um, unfortunately, someone at some point decided to use a glue to try to, to consolidate the flaking paint and it just made the paint flake worse. And now it's made it very hard to treat because every time you try to humidify the paint to, to consolidate it, it just wants to turn into goo and fall off. And also if you wanna uh, humidify the, and reshape the, the boot, you can't do that very easily either. So in a few minutes, we'll come up onto the body and show you exactly what we're trying to do. Well, and we often say that we spend a good portion of our time uh, endeavoring to reverse other people's good intentions. We'll circle back to that again in our own treatment plan. Let me show also the next slide, which is an overall image of Potty Bostet. Um, and in this uh, room view, he's at the back of the room. So in the shared screen slide now, you see a condition photograph of the mummy before Mimi began her work. And I know there are several things you wanted to detail here for the audience as well, Mimi. Yes, absolutely. This mummy has obviously been damaged probably by tomb robbers a very, very long time ago, but they sliced all along the upper, the, the sides of his upper body and removed all the upper layers of linen. Presumably at that point, they took off the shroud, exposed areas at his toes, the, the, it sliced open at the toes. Um, it's, he, there was really a significant amount of damage to the outer wrappings, but interestingly, because he's so thoroughly wrapped and the wrappings were each layer of wrappings was very well or thickly covered with some mixture of gums, resins, oils. We're not entirely certain at this point because we haven't done any analysis yet, but you can, you can see how dark he is. Um, he's in an, and he's incredibly heavy. I mean, I didn't weigh him, but I can't lift his feet. So he's a very heavy boy. Um, and the sides now, because it's so saturated with these resins and things, the linens are very, very brittle. And so one has to be incredibly cautious about how to humidify them and put them back. Um, we'll see in a little bit that um, I've been able to rehumidify his feet. They were a little bit more flexible, the linens around the feet. And so that's beginning to go back together. The work on the sides is much, much more slow. Um, and Sorry. Can you go to the next slide? I will. And before I, I tr um, advance one, I just will point out to the audience so that we can um, remember it and come back to it when we're looking together in the room, um, the feet and how disheveled the linens are. And then up here at the chest, 
um, where the linens have been cut and fallen away. And then this dangling piece of heavily coated resinous uh, linen on top here. Um, we'll see all those again when we have the view again into the room. So let me advance the slide. And now we're looking down on the chest of Padi Bastet. It appears that perhaps the tomb robbers, we don't really know, were looking for amulets. And so a hole was dug through the linens into his, you know, farther down into the lower layers of linen. Um, interestingly, they're still, it's still considerably above the body. So there are still a number of more layers below that. And I'd say that's what, a centimeter or more deep. So it's, that hole in the middle is really quite a deep thing. Um, and it's, it's just kind of sad that this body was so badly moved around and, and disturbed. And you can also see how much dirt there is. It's just dust. Yes, lots of dust. But Mimi and I are not uh, unacquainted with dusty mummies. So finding one like Tao Cyrus, who is in very good condition um, with regard to the the linens still being in place and there not being a lot of uh, deteriorated debris on, on them um, is rather unusual for us. So working on one like Padi Bastet, which took a fair amount of vacuuming to get him ready to be um, reshaped and repositioned and stabilized is um, kind of the norm for you, Mimi. So once Mimi um, came and got to know these mummies this past week, took the photos that we've just shared with you and many, many more to document their conditions, um, we return to our ethical guidelines for the treatment of human remains. And so I'm gonna put up a text slide um, and have a little bit of conversation with Mimi and with all of you just to share with you. Um, whoops, oh, oh, I forgot about this slide, Mimi. Sorry about right. that. Um, speaking of documentation, back up one, um, we have this, uh, representation of Mimi's careful examination. Here she is counting threads on the shroud of Tao Cyrus using a thread counter and looking with a needle to count the individual number of threads um, across a measured centimeter. And then uh, also on your slide is Mimi's wonderful and careful documentation of how the wrappings are applied to the body. Every one of the reports that we get from Mimi, and this will probably be what the 12th and 13th mummies you've worked on with us, um, we get these wonderful reports that detail the wrappings. And um, I'm always amazed at how thoroughly Mimi is able to interpret the layers down to the body um, with limited view into them uh, as a whole. But because Mimi knows this process of, of mummification and wrapping throughout periods of Egyptian history so thoroughly, uh, she's able to detail for us the wrappings. And so these little drawings help us to see the layers of linen that are applied to the mummy and to document that as part of the history of how this mummy was prepared in antiquity. It helps us to interpret um, how it relates to other mummification processes as well. So this, the, those particular layers are all the ones from Patty Bastet, who we can really see into uh, much more clearly. I will be able to do the one for Taro Cyrus, but I haven't been able to do it yet um, because I'm going to have to go back and look at uh, Jonathan's report. And, and his report has a lot of information and scan data about each of the inner layers because her body is still in very good shape and we can't really see beyond the outer couple of layers. I think it's wonderful to understand and appreciate how the technology of CT scanning, which we've harnessed in all of our studies of mummies, thanks to our collaboration with Emory University Hospital and Dr. Bell Torres and his team, um, and most recently with Jonathan Elias, combining that with your experience and observations directly of the bodies really allow us to understand them as thoroughly as we can. Um, and this is part of our mission as we work on these bodies to preserve them is also to record as much as we can. So this slide gives you a glimpse into how we are doing that. Once we have um, taken this information down or begun to collect it, in the case of, of those we're still piecing together, um, we return to a plan of how we will go about stabilizing the mummies. So over the many years that Mimi and I have worked together, um, we've outlined a series of not necessarily steps, but guidelines that help us to determine the process by which we will treat the mummies. Each mummy is an individual, each one has had its own history of um, ancient history as well as 
more modern collection history and the burial in between. And so taking into account that individuality and the individual history, uh, we approach each mummy as a unique case, but there are some general statements that we can make. So first and foremost, our goal is to stabilize the mummy and to limit further damage. Mimi, I'm gonna ask you to tell us a little bit about how we restore the dignity to the mummy, because there are a lot of different ways uh, enumerated here that we do that. And we think of each of those possibilities where they are relevant to the individual mummy as restoring dignity to the mummy as it was repaired in, in antiquity. Well, one of the first things that we do is to clean to remove any non-original material such as dust and soot from storage or exhibition. This is um, really important because it does damage to the linens as well as making the body look it just looks disrespected. We want to make sure that we, if the if the body has, um, if the mummy has been exposed to the point where um, bones are are um, accessible, like the old kingdom mummy that we worked on together, um, we want to rearticulate the bones where possible so that we can return the mummy to its original form. And you can actually see some of that work that we did um, if you go to the Carlos Museum website. Um, you'll see um, the, there's a, um, a video of us to, the, our discussion of that mummy, the Old Kingdom mummy. Um, we want to reattach detached pieces. These cartonnage panels have been taken off of Tao Cyrus. They belong back with her. They were part of her original trappings. They should still be with the body. We want to make sure that they can go on and be safely put back on the body in the way that they were as much as possible. We want to maintain all original material with the mummy, regardless of how, how small. Um, obviously not the dust that we're taking off, but we want to take, keep, we keep all of the pieces and put them, anything, any linen fragments, anything else, we'll try to put it back with the body and if not store it very carefully with the body's materials that um, are going into storage. For example, some of these very, very fragile and broken pieces of linen might not be able to be put back on the body, but we wanna be able to keep them associated with the body as much as possible. So all of those steps uh, where applicable are ways that we can restore dignity to this mummy prepared in antiquity. We are very mindful of the fact that as we work on the body, we want to avoid damage due to any of the methods and materials that we use. Mimi spoke earlier of the fact that it's quite challenging to treat in particular the cartonnage uh, boot or foot casing on Tao Cyrus because of a previous intervention and that that adhesive is, is causing us some challenge. So we're very mindful of the fact that when we choose our methods and materials, we want to enable future research and intervention as necessary. Indeed, and also to make sure we record exactly where we do any kind of intervention. So the reports that will be generated here will be following along with this on the database of the museum's website. Um, where we also want to avoid altering or obscuring any details of wrapping and mummification so that we don't want to confuse people and make them think that, that the mummy looked in a different way than it actually should have done. And this varies widely from ob object or mummy to mummy is sort of how you approach that sort of lack of obscuring. But over the years that we've worked together, um, I feel like Mimi, your approach has become more and more minimalist in that whenever possible, um, we secure the linens to themselves and we allow the linens to be all that, the ancient linens to be all that are seen. We don't cover them with new linen. We don't wrap them in something else whenever possible. Uh, we leave the, the linens exposed as they were meant to be seen from antiquity. Exactly. Maybe only if we need to put in modern linen straps, as you'll see shortly on um, Tau Cyrus, um, we want to make sure that it's obvious that, that they are new, but on, so they're just a little bit different, but that um, it, it, we also are using them in the way that it would have been used in antiquity and not creating some new pattern or something new that would confuse a scholar looking at the object. 
Perfect. And then as part of that documentation and our choice of method and material, we want to ensure that anything we add, like those new straps, could be completely removed in the future without altering the original material. So anything that we add can be taken away and it can be done without uh, causing damage or change to the original mummy. This is um, an underlying tenant of all conservation treatment. So those of you who've heard me talk before or have heard Mimi talk before or have heard other conservation talks have heard about our lack of or our strong desire to leave no trace, uh, to leave it be true that it's possible to reverse our efforts. After all, we will not be the last person to study or treat any mummy. And so it's important to make it possible for any new methods in the future to be used without compromising the original body. I mean, we, as I was working on Tau Osiris, I discovered about 10 pins that had been used to try to hold that poor soft linen shroud onto the body and presumably to also hold bits of the cartonnage on. And so they were not doing any good whatsoever for any of those pieces. So Mimi, I'm going to come join you and we're going okay. to, uh, I'm going to put on my mask uh, per Emery's requirements and get my gloves and my lab coat on and walk across the hall. So bear with us as we go see who's in our neighborhood this week. We visit the mummies. We have to have our gloves to handle them. I know you've got your gloves in there. I have my gloves. I'm armed. You're ready. Okay. And I'm going to turn off my um, screen in here and we'll both be together across the hall. <laughs> my computer can't see me or feel my fingers now that I've gotten written but on my oh, it was just... <laughs> oh, That's funny. Okay, let I me love it. here, escape, stop share, so that we'll be able to see us all together and then I will turn off my video and join you. And I'll move out of the way. Welcome. <laughs> Won't you be my neighbor? <laughs> okay. Now we should have both of us. Right. All right. We may have to move the, the camera or something. We will. I have the controls. Okay, so we're gonna, shall we start together on Ty Osiris? Um, I'd like to like, like to start on Patty Bastet, Patty Bastet for a minute. Okay, excellent. So I should zoom in. Let's do that. All right, folks. Hopefully this won't be a wild ride. Now let me come to you. Other way? Nope, the other way. Every time. Yep. It's like working in a mirror. Come on. There we are. There we are. Okay. Hello. I could go lower so that you can almost see my face. <laughs> there. So we've been humidifying um, the linens at the feet because they have less resin. So I just wanted to, this is the unveiling because I haven't seen this since we stopped on Friday. Um, and so what I've taken off is a very, very lightweight snake weight. And then this is a piece of soft Tyvek, the kind of thing that one even finds on houses. It allows moisture, um, like humidity to come through, but not actual wet water. So I've made myself a nice little um, humidification chamber. This was a piece of blotter that was wet on Friday. Now I have two wonderful hair clips that are holding a piece Sorry, of modern linen. Of you. Oh, Hold have you on. lost me? Just for a second. Oh. We were getting those hair clips and I went too far. Okay. Hair clips. Hair clips are coming off. And then this is a piece of modern linen that's now holding another piece of blotter in place with little weights. So as you saw in that before treatment picture, all of this linen was folded around away from the foot. And now the foot is back in pretty good shape. I'll have a little bit more to do to flatten down things, but 
what one could see at the top before was you were actually looking down into the toes because someone had sliced this right down to the tops of the toes, which is so tragic. And as a result, the tips of several toes were lost and one entire little toe was completely missing. So once I finished with this, I'll be able to just secure a little band across the top of that to hold it into place. But I haven't found exactly which way it needs to go yet. So you've gently coaxed these linens back over those toes, back into the arrangement as close as we can approximate to how they were in antiquity. Exactly. Wonderful. And, and it took about three days for that. So I had to do it layer by layer by layer. And that's exactly what's going on here. So if you remember, this was that piece of... Let me move to be with you. Oh, yep. Hang oh, on. A little bit more. Come on, camera. There we are. Maybe okay. I should sit so I'm not in the way. Um, we have this piece of the broken linens with the resin coating on it. That camera or the light is better. There you go. And then all of this had a little bit of cut, but this was where this sort of almost blooming onion arrangement was going on. I've put about three layers back up of these broken pieces of the linen. Um, it takes a fair lot of, amount of work. I don't like to use any kind of modern adhesives on the mummy, but because of his weight and because of the brittleness of these, that couldn't be wrapped. My original plan had been to, to maybe wrap this with cartonnage from all around from the bottom up, but they just continue to break if you do that. So what I'm doing now is using a very compatible consolidant that's reactivating the original uh, resins and gums on the linen and putting it back in place and holding it there. So it will all look like this when it's done. I was amazed actually at how much you've been able to bring those linens back into position and secure them by essentially regenerating the old uh, coating materials and adding a little bit of this cellulosic material. It's quite fantastic that we're getting it back into place. It already looks more tidy. And by the end of week two, those of you who are following us live on Mummy Cam and along in Mimi's blog that she's entering um, throughout the work process on the Carlos Museum's website, you'll be able to track this progress right along with us. And then these linens are all being stabilized. It's still possible that we might be able to put some sort of crepeline over that just to hold all of this in place. But because it's going into storage and is unlikely to be on view, there won't be a lot of handling. So I'm not sure that we need to do that and risk um, you know, putting any extra pressure onto the linen. Exactly. But we'll, we'll determine that by the end of next week. Well, you have also done a fair amount already to reshape and stabilize Tao Cyrus. Shall we move to her? Yes. OK, bear with us as we Oop. get the camera to join the front of the room. Let's see which way I need to go. Panning across our workspace, there she is. And let me go wider so you can see the whole mummy. Great. Perfect. I'll come up a little bit so maybe we can see you this time. Great, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the first thing that we did was to clean Tyrosiris's outer linens and removed. There was an awful lot of just old dust and, and debris from deteriorated linen. And so that was carefully removed. And then some of the linens have started to become stabilized in a very similar way to Patty Bastet. But um, uh, I took a couple of days to work on each of these panels, these two panels separately, the, the pectoral panel and the um, uh, abdominal panel, and you can see here the tab is now back on to the come, abdominal panel. Come down and let everyone see how much they have been put back on, because we saw them in slides where they were separate. And now in this view, you can see that the trappings have been actually reshaped to fit back right over the mummy. Because when I started, they were absolutely dead flat like plates. So this one stuck out from the side, you know, it was, it was up a, several centimeters. And now it's just set back down evenly. What's, was, it was a relief that that worked because 
um, in this period of um, Egyptian cartonage ma manufacture, they used a red paint that just loves to disappear or get gooey and, and sticky and then vanish when you're trying to humidify it. And it, it's always a risk, I feel, so that I've, I've learned a technique of being able to put it in a humidification chamber, then let it almost dry again, and then start putting a little bit of pressure. It, and particularly because these are so thin, there's, there are only about two layers of linen thick. Well, so and this is where your very fragile your experience and perspective of having worked on many of these really comes into play. Often the steps themselves seem straightforward. We're going to humidify and shape. Uh, we're going to add some adhesive. But knowing how to anticipate the way the, the original materials will interact with your own intervention is a significant part of being a careful conservator. Um, and this red paint is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. So on this um, Let's see, you want to come down to this one? I don't mean to. Oh, yeah. Well, one of the things that we're trying to do is figure out, you can see across the top of this panel, there's the remains of an original linen band. There's a little bit left across the top of this panel. There's another band here across what's left of the foot case. So I made a replacement band as a mock-up to see whether we liked the look of this linen that we had actually made for our old kingdom mummy. Uh, where am I? <laughs> I'll come wider now. I okay. want people to be able to see those bands. There, so this is a piece of linen that we dyed uh, in-house years ago, I think. And mm -hmm. it was coming in to be handy because Mimi has found that it's a pretty good match for the color and texture, um, weave density and all for the wrappings on Ty Osiris. So this one, this lower one is the one that you've added now based on the evidence of where the originals were. And then given that there's one here, you'll add another band there. Yep. And the big question is gonna be, how are we gonna add the band without doing any damage? Because this is still glued to the surface. So that's something we're gonna be solving together this week um, because it's, this is really adhered down. So it's gonna take a little bit of fiddling to make sure that we don't do any damage to the remaining original linen. This, then you come down to the boot. Let me get us down to the boot with you a little bit because I, yep. I think you're gonna have a little bit of a reveal down here, right? Um, not so no, much on oh, the boot. Well, but it looks quite different than it did in- the, Oh yes, I see what you're saying. Yes, that images. kind of reveal, you betcha. Let's see if I can get us closer though. There we are. Okay, so people might remember from the uh, image in the slide that this boot was quite misshapen and really didn't look like it was gonna go back on the mummy. And given its previous treatment with that adhesive that was being uh, difficult, um, it's actually quite miraculous that you've already got it back on. <laughs> I actually wasn't sure it was going to go. Um, what what I've had to do is reshape it from being really flat um, and gotten this far. Then what I'm gonna to have to do is take it back off and fix the back because it's split in about four places across the interior of the back and all of the layers are delaminating. So th that you can see that there's, in, um, in this case, I can see eh, three and a bit of layers of linen. Each one of those has to be put back together very carefully. And then we can start humidifying it again. The big question is gonna be how much um, sort of additional material are we gonna to need to make this as stable as possible? Fortunately, we know what these boots look like. Um, and then I've done a little bit of work on her foot area. So that is, I don't know that you can really see that very carefully. Um, I'm just gonna finish tidying up the bottom of that. Um, but but you probably won't be able to see that because of the covering. And so you have this, uh, as you mentioned, Amhadi Bastet, this layer of Tyvek um, as an interleaving between the original mummy. You've also got a clear plastic layer. Which right, is that's as, a complete barrier. As an right. actual barrier for the manipulations. And as we finish shaping the cartonnage and adding those straps, we will remove those layers and the linen, excuse me, the cartonnage trappings will be lying directly on the body as they were originally. 
Yep. And so one of the challenges and questions here um, around the feet in particular is that they end several inches from the tip of the toes and whether we will need to recreate some modern simulated cartonnage in order to hold that shape more um, correctly mm -hmm. and to suggest to a viewer what might have been there, but also to keep this now very fragile structure uh, intact into the future. Exactly. Yeah. And you can see this band will be putting another replacement band on it. Um, and there may have been one up here, but we have no evidence for it, at least that I can tell at the moment. Well, one of the most dramatic reshapings, aside from this um, toe casing or boot, is the head, the mask for the head. And I'd like to take us up there with the camera and then um, have a chance for folks to see that before we take any questions. So let me figure out how to get us up there a moment, widen our view a little bit and see if I can take us in the I'll right come over here. Look at that, the right direction. Okay, and there it is with you. Right here. And let me zoom in again. Okay, looks like I need to come over just a little bit. Other, other way. way. Other way. It's always backwards. perfect. Okay, so this um, cartonnage mask fits completely around the head of Ta Osiris. And over the last week, we have been introducing a little bit of humidity using an ultrasonic humidifier. And that's the device you see sitting on the table with it. And if I turn it on, um, let me give it a second to start, we might be able to see some of the moisture. There's a blotter that you can aim it at. If I stand in front of it, let's see if I- Maybe see. up against your shirt, there. yes. Now are we seeing it? Yeah, I can. So I'm getting- No, all, go lower. Go lower? Go Am lower. Am I getting all no, misty? Because the problem is you're not quite on, on camera. Oh. Well, there it is. It's blowing in there front of go. my shirt now. Okay, so this gentle mist of cool humidity is what we have added to the cartonnage um, and onto blotters in order to soften it over time, uh, to gently encourage it to take a new shape. So just as Mimi uh, did on Paribastet, some of the layers have already been repaired. And you can see as I remove the little hair clips, those are not so easy to get to these days since everybody's not getting perms. And then I think I have another clip over here. Take those away. And then we have been adding um, layers of padding to slowly expand the front from the back. So maybe I'll pull out one of the foam pieces. And then if I take away some of the rest of this padding, there's a tiny piece of linen. And then we'll take out that may be a piece of, from the shroud. There's still a couple of shroud pieces that were stuck. You can see the head, the shroud is missing there. It would once have come all the way up and you can see where it was there. There's little traces of it, but unfortunately it just must have fr fragmented as it was taken off. So when we started this week, our goal was to get the mask opened up enough to put it onto a styrofoam wig stand so that Mimi could actually work with the mummy. And here she's insert, inserting that wig stand. There we are. Okay, now we can see the wig stand going in. Hang on, I may need to go from the other direction. Oh, okay. Since we haven't done this before. Yes, you're seeing this live. You're seeing this live. We, I feel like we need a drum roll. There we go. Okay, Ta -da! chin in place and I'll let you lift and I'll move this out of your way so you can put her back down. Ta-da. So we've been able to open out the front and back of the mask enough to allow it to rest, hey, not bad, Yeah. on the wig stand. And she's actually not nearly as corkscrewed as she was. So our future step will be to continue to shape the back of that mask, which is still a little bit distorted, and um, eventually to get it widened out enough that by the end of this week, we can do it, Mimi, we can do it. We're gonna put it we back it. on Ty Osiris's head. So we've got to get just enough space in those in the mask to fit it over the head. Here. And one of the things we can do is put counter pressure, since it's, we'll put a little bit more padding on the wig stand, and then we can put a little counter pressure there and a little bit more that way. And so as, as we go, we'll sort of, realign all of the positions at the top of the head. 
So with this um, overview and your patience as we dealt with the mics and then my zooming back and forth with the camera, um, we've given you a bit of an introduction and insight into how Mimi is spending these two weeks in Ackerman Hall working on the two mummies and their associated cartonnage. I think Elizabeth is manning the Q&A for us and we're gonna remain on view. Um, I'll come over to the other side of the screen. And if there are questions, we're happy to try to answer them. Bring a chair. There are questions, Renee and Mimi. Thank you so much for that fascinating look um, at the work you've been doing this week. Um, we have several questions. One is about the coffins, not only for, for these particular mummies, but I think the question might have to do with Ptolemaic mummy coffins in general. What sort of coffins would the, there have been for these? And then did these come into the collection with coffins? or did they come in as they are? Super, so um, thank you. The, um, are, we, are we headless? Let me see if I can raise the screen just a little so we, yeah, we don't sit. have to remain disembodied. Okay, um, so the coffins did come into the Carlos collection with these mummies, and we will be displaying Ta Osiris with her coffin um, when we make the exhibition in spring of 2023. Her coffin's in very good condition. Um, it will need a little bit of stabilization um, and it has been previewed already here at the museum for events. So we're delighted to be able to put that on display with her as she would have been in antiquity. Um, the coffin of Potty Bastet is not in condition that can be made display ready. So we're taking this opportunity in treating him to be respectful to the body and we will keep it with its coffin and storage, but the two will not go back on display. The coffins are quite large. Um, they have a very round sort of barrel. They're both chest. anthropomorphic coffins. Oh yes, thank you. So if you'll tell us a little about them. Well, they are shaped like mummies on the outside. So um, they, we can put a picture. I'll try to put a picture um, in one of my uh, mummy diaries. Oh, that's a great idea. So um, stay tuned to the website and you'll be able to see a, a photograph of them. Hers um, looks a little bit like this on the head. So it's a, a, a figure with a, a, a wig like this with the sort of Egyptian blue coloring, as I recall. Mm -hmm. um, and then the body is shaped sort of like a wrapped mummy. Um, so it basically looks like this, but taken into wood, painted wood. And fully painted. And fully painted. His coffin, unfortunately, was, I think, scrubbed by somebody at some point in time, who knows when and where. And it's in very, very sad shape. Yes, but we do have it and we will keep it in storage along with the mummy. And you're thinking of doing multispectral analysis, aren't you, to try to see if you can see more. We'll do anything we whatever's can to, left. to interpret the, the remains. Because we'd like to know his real name. He was given the name Patty Bastet by some previous owner who somehow thought he was a pharaoh and the pharaoh Patty Bastet, but unfortunately he wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't even close to that period of time, so never mind. <laughs> Any more? I know people were um, fascinated to see the humidifier, and we have questions in general about the tools that you use. So people are very curious about your tools. And then re related, somebody specifically asking about the vacuum. How do you vacuum a mummy? Oh, this is a great question. So yes, our tools are always fun. Um, and often I think people are surprised to see how humble they are. Um, Mimi has an array, she's going through the table now of little brushes and little metal spatula and bone shape, bone shaped, uh, bone that is shaped into a spatula. And these brushes are used to lay down adhesive, to introduce moisture, to remove dust. So lots of different brushes. Um, we mentioned the hair clips. Those are very handy for keeping something under light pressure since we can't stand there and wait for it to set. We let the um, pins, the little hair pins, be our um, ec extra fingers. The humidifier is a cool mist ultrasonic humidifier. So actually it's introducing um, vapor, moisture vapor, and it is always fun to see it. So thanks for your patience as I tried to get it to wave in front of my dark shirt. Um, it just introduces a very small um, amount of humidity. We can do it directly to the cartonnage or linens. We can also introduce the humidity using a sprayer 
I think our sprayer is in the front of the table here um, onto oh, yes. blotters. And this sprayer puts out a, a fine mist. We then mist the blotter paper and put the blotter in association with the uh, linen or cartonage. With it's an, separated by many layers of things. Yes. <laughs> with a barrier layer to allow the uh, moisture to transfer, but not the, wet, the wetness. One of the cool things I think is that, you know, almost anybody who puts on makeup, except those of us who are still wearing masks, <laughs> Um, so I don't think I've worn makeup in over a year, there you are. <laughs> but these little makeup sponges are wonderful for painted surfaces like cartonage. If you are very, very careful and work under magnification, you can see exactly what you're cleaning. And so you end up with hmm, I don't know. something that is this going to show? Um, well, we've got pictures on the blog for sure. Um, I'll see if, I don't know if you can see, see how it. black that is. I, I don't might know. be able to zoom in. And while I'm zooming in, let me let you hold those up. Um, I'll also tell you a little about our vacuum. All right, so come down a little closer to the table. There you are. I don't know if it's possible to see if we put white behind. See how dirty they are? That's picked up a lot of um, just soot, plain dirt. Just dirt. That's not uh, not ancient intentional material, but instead just plain dirt that we've lifted up. The other way we remove um, some dirt is using a vacuum. And the vacuum that we use is fitted with a HEPA filter so that it picks up and retains the very fine particles. So we're not spitting them back out into the room. Um, and it also is fitted with a rheostat so that we can slow down the amount of suction. Because you're absolutely right. Um, how would you vacuum a mummy and not suck up all of these loose pieces of linen? Well, you do it indirectly using a brush um, so that you don't put the, the hose of the vacuum directly on the object, but instead you hold the hose above the object and you conduct the dust off of the body um, using a brush and into that nozzle. And then we have the nozzle on very low suction. And as Mimi is holding it up, I'm not sure if we can see it. Let me see if I can get a little higher. Um, we also... Can you can see it? Okay. We also have it fitted with a very small uh, tip. So these micro tips are often sold for cleaning electronics. And we just put it on the end of this vacuum that has a rheostat to lower the suction and has, and then we use it indirectly. So we don't suck out anything up directly off the body, but instead conducting that dust up with a brush. And, and also one of the things, for example, when we worked on the old kingdom mummy, we put fresh vacuum bags and we saved absolutely everything that we removed. He was, it was possible on that mummy to be able to take all of those and, and bag things up and put them back in because as we were working, we discovered a lot of the material that was coming up was in fact his completely deteriorated skin because he'd been so infested with insects in the past. And thinking back to those guidelines for treating human remains, we want to make sure that we keep all of the original together. Um, in the case of these bodies, there was a fair amount of just dust and debris on the surface that we could remove. Um, and they are still intact essentially as wrappings. So there's nowhere to put bags of debris back in uh, should there have needed to be. No, but in this case, we'll be able to keep it with the coffin and, the, and all of this in storage, very carefully labeled so that it's still in association with the body, but, but just not back in physically. Okay. Our friend Richard Sandifer, who is the president of the Atlanta chapter, the Georgia chapter of RC, the American Research Center in Egypt is here with us today. Um, thank you, Richard, for all of your support of the Carlos. And he has a question about the color on the mummy and that it appears that the, the female mummy would have been quite colorful in ancient times. And what do you as conservators, will you do anything to enhance the color or will you leave it as is? You can't really bring back fade, color to faded linen. There's nothing we can do for that. However, putting the cartonage panels back on, they've brightened up considerably from what they were when we first started and they were very dusty. Um, and by the time we're finished with the boot, I think that will also look a little brighter. Um, we may be able to do a little bit of, um, uh, we often use uh, painted tissue that very fine papers that we color separately and are able then to use these. Um, am I on camera? You are. Mm -hmm. But um, we're able to use these to fill in some losses. It's completely removable. 
Um, and so all of the paintwork goes onto this and then we're able to put that back on. So it will make it look like it's a little bit more intact and a little bit livelier, um, but you can't do anything about the fading to the linen. It's sad. It would have been a, a lovely sort of pale salmon pink when it started, but it's gone now. And we can see evidence of that color because the cartonnage where it laid protected the linen from some fading. And so when the cartonnage is off, you can actually see a shadow of the shapes of the cartonnage panels that remain in what used to be a slightly, it's still, it's still quite discolored, but you can tell it was a different color. Um, and none of it appears as it did in antiquity. Uh, these dyes are incredibly light, unstable. So over time, the color is lost. And we don't regenerate the color just as conservators don't repaint paintings. We don't repaint or re-dye these linens. Uh, we instead present to you what has come to us from antiquity, but we stabilize it for its future. So the same is true of the paint where it has uh, faded or cracked away or uh, discolored from grime because some of the paints absorb the dirt um, and some of the paint colors shift over time and are less vibrant. Uh, we, have, we won't regenerate those, we won't repaint them. But lifting off this gray uh, dust, as Mimi showed with the cosmetic sponges, goes a long way to brighten up the color. And then um, as she was showing with those little bits of tissue, selectively filling in losses with colored tissue, which is a little brighter, helps the visitor and viewer's eye to reintegrate that brighter color into the overall appearance. So it won't look tremendously different from as you've seen it today, but when it's well lit by our talented designers and presented to you in the galleries, you'll be able to appreciate how fantastically colorful she was in antiquity. And you've, you've spoken a little bit about this just now, but uh, Hannah Zinsky asks, what are some of the things that you are doing to mark the new from the old? Mm. So Mimi, do you wanna talk a little bit about, I'm gonna try to get us back on view so we're both in there, there you are. Um, what we do to mark the new from the old, um, some of it has to do with your careful record keeping. Exactly. Um, one of the things we, we often say in conservation that we have a rule that you should be able, um, it's six foot six inches. So you should not be able to see it from six feet away. That is to say the, the whatever you're working on, it shouldn't like be in the face of the viewer. Um, you, you shouldn't like have to spend your time trying to figure out what's real and what isn't. But if you get six inches away from the object, you should be able to see the difference. And so, for example, the linen that we're using, modern linen is not woven at all the same way the ancient linen was. That had a much higher weft count, I mean, warp count than a weft count. And so it looks different. The, the, even the surface appearance of this is different from an ancient linen. And so um, you'll be able to tell, the color will be slightly different we won't, don't want to make it so different that you look down and go, what is that? But on the other hand, you want to be able to look at it and go, oh yeah, that must be a modern replacement. And, and did you find linen in that color or did you have to- We made it. Ma you made it to match. And what did you use to dye it with? It was cotton dyes, dyes that are useful. I mean, linen and cotton take different dyes from um, uh, wool. silk and wool. So we used, we used specific cotton dyes for this. Yes, and then sometimes when Mimi uses um, silk crepeline, a silk that you can see through kind of like stockings to stabilize parts of a, of a mummy, um, though that sometimes gets dyed with tea or coffee. Yeah, uh, tea particularly. The color. So um, lots of tricks up her sleeve, um, but these linens do, as Mimi says, look quite different. And if you're familiar with our work on the Old Kingdom mummy, either from the video, which is on our website or from a visit to the galleries, um, those close-up images really do allow you to see that while the overall object appears as a whole, when you look more closely, our linens are um, woven differently and newer. They aren't filled with bug holes and tears and they don't look brittle. Whereas the ancient linen tells you that it's ancient. These objects are old and we want them to look old. And the same is true of the mummies. We respect their age and we let the tears and holes and fade be a part of that evidence. 
We also have a question asking um, if the Emory Hospital charges us for scanning the mummies. And so I wonder if you could just speak generally about the wonderful relationship that we have with people like Bill Torres and others at Emory University Hospital that makes um, some of the, the scanning of our mummies for analysis available. Absolutely. We are wonderfully fortunate to have um, specifically in Dr. Bill Torres, who is part of the museum's uh, leadership board, but also in his team uh, at the Department of Radiology at Emory University Hospital right here um, across campus, um, the opportunity to study mummies and other objects. In fact, um, one of my colleagues in the lab and I were over at Wesley Woods CT scanning a boat from this collection, a little model boat um, a few weeks ago. So we are very fortunate to have this long-standing collaboration. And in fact, some of the early CT scanning of the Niagara Falls mummies uh, done in the 1999, 2000, 2001, was really some of the most thorough early CT scanning of mummies done. And in fact, uh, when Dr. Elias came um, before COVID to scan these two mummies, he was really excited to meet Dr. Torres uh, and have the opportunity to recognize that contribution of Emory Healthcare. So we're, we're very fortunate that they allow us to come over and they don't give us a bill. Uh, we often go early in the morning or late at night or after business hours for the hospital. The technicians who run the equipment for us are incredibly generous with their time and they often stay late for us to work on objects and are very kind to see this as an opportunity to share with the museum, to support our research and to have the um, really fun time of examining other types of objects than they see every day. And a question for Mimi, you've worked on so many um, mummies over your career, including other ones at the Carlos Museum. And people always are curious, and several people have asked about where do these fit in in the spectrum of difficulty um, and condition um, in terms of, of the mummies you've worked on over the years? Well, I have to say the Old Kingdom mummy was the most difficult mummy I've ever worked on. And if Renee <laughs> wasn't working with me, we you'd still be staring at a pile of dust. Yes, um, but unlike that one, these have their heads still on. So yes. that's a step in the right direction for sure. So compared to others you've worked on? The, these, well, okay. The Carnage on Tyosiris is in relatively good condition except for the boot. So that's a, a significant problem. Um, but her body, her mummy, mummified body is actually in fairly good shape. Patty Bastet, not so much. Um, if we were trying to make him really suitable for the gallery, we would probably have to think about other things to do to make him a, a little, little more integrated. Um, and we could have different discussions about that. I worked on a, a mummy at the Field Museum in Chicago where we knew that this mummy was going to be traveling in a touring show. And so mm -hmm. in the end, we decided to actually replace missing linens and broken linens because he couldn't have taken the, just the vibrations of that tour. But all of that can come off. It was just re-wrapping on the outside and it can all come back off. And those linens were actually like hers, quite soft and flexible. So it really wasn't a problem. So I'd say these are kind of like middle ground. You know, there's some really interesting issues. I mean, there's some things that we'd really like to be able to do, but we can't. We found out from Jonathan's um, CT scans that there is something metal inside her feet around her ankles that looks like it was poured on them. What is that? And because she's in good condition and unlike the morbid Victorians, we don't unwrap mummies out of curiosity. We instead respect the wrappings. Uh, we're not going to tear open her feet <laughs> and try to see what's going on in there. Um, so if through mummy, mimi, mm, let me try that again. If through Mimi's continued examination of the mummies, um, she finds an opening. We have a tiny little um, uh, like an endoscope. USB endoscope that attaches to a um, 
an iPad and we could put that in and look around. But it seems that Tao Osiris is in such good shape uh, in terms of her wrappings remaining intact. We really don't have a route in yet for that examination. And, and we certainly don't want to cause damage through our project so we wouldn't make a hole. Um, but we, we were able to learn that through the CT imaging done here over a year ago. So there's, there's more to be understood uh, for sure. But I would say she's in very good condition, comparatively speaking. He's sort of, as you say, middle ground. We have on display at the moment in the Carlos, in addition to the old kingdom mummy, um, Pashid Kansu is there. And Pashid Kansu had to have his linens wrapped back around him, um, as did the priest who's also on view in the mummy in the coffin and one of the things that I remember about the priest in particular is all these linens had been just kind of opened up and you were looking at the body so our goal of course to restore dignity is to rewrap the body and Mimi gently humidified as she's done to the toes here on Potty Bostet those layers and place them back into position and if you see him in the galleries now he's a very tidy bundle uh, with all of his original linen wrapped around him. Thank you both for sharing your work with everyone today. It was a fascinating um, conversation and I encourage everyone to join back in on Tuesday, on Monday uh, when Mummy Cam will go live again at 10 a.m. Um, and you can, so you can watch the, the progress um, as it unfolds over the next week. And then I hope you'll all join us on Friday at noon Eastern Standard Time uh, when Dr. Melinda Hartwig, who is our curator of ancient Egyptian, uh, Near Eastern and Nubian art, as well as pr Professor Emerita at Georgia State University will introduce her new series that she's done with the Great Courses Plus uh, with an introductory lecture on um, to the tour of ancient um, Egypt series. So noon Eastern Standard Time, I've put the link to that in the chat, as well as a link to a video about Mim Mimi and Renee's work on the Carlos Museum's Old Kingdom Mummy that uh, we worked together on that video several years ago uh, with Hal Jacobs, a filmmaker in town. So it's a great video. So thank you all for joining us today. We hope to see you next Friday, this Friday, this coming Friday. Super. Thanks. Thank you so thank much. You. Bye-bye. I think the webinar's off, but I'll just go.
Ante la noticia, la noticia es que ya. 